Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, and I, I, because I'm sharing a screen, I apologize um, if there's like a question or someone has a comment. Um, so please feel free to to really bother me <laughs> if you uh, if you have something that you want to share. I'm going to mute everyone for now, but I am allowing participants to unmute themselves. So please feel free to just jump in and share a thought um, if anyone would like to share. So, so continuing a little, um, just a summary from last week, we just talked uh, the introduction of Tehillim. We talked a lot about how it is such a unique Sefer um, and specifically a unique book within Chumash because it is just a very honest and raw telling of emotions. The fact that we have within our own canon, someone writing and reciting poetry about them having a crisis of faith or anger towards God is really unique and so beautiful that we have something that we can really relate to that's so real and so human and that we're not expected to be more than human. We're expected to use our humanity to become better people, right? To feel anger and to feel sorrow, to feel praise and thanksgiving. Um, and many of the Psalms that we do have kind of go through that journey of someone working through their emotions that hopefully ends off in a different place, which we saw last week. So I'm hoping we can hit um, three to four today. We'll see some of them a little shorter, longer, some more commentary than not. Um, I'm actually going to start with Tehillim 80, which is pay, which is on the second page of the link, which is right here. Um, this is a communal lament. This is Psalm 80 to Hillam Pei. It's the longest one we're going to do today, but we'll go through it. Um, and it's 20 psukim long, 20 verses long. Um, so what, one thing we also talked about last week was that there are different genres of to Hillam and that this is something the academics love to do. But I do love I do love bringing in sometimes academia because it helps clarify what we're doing. So academics love to say this, this psalm is from an individual person who is lamenting. That's an individual lament. This person is a doing a communal Thanksgiving. They're speaking from the community, a Thanksgiving or a praise. So there's different genres that they like plugging in. What I do love about it is because sometimes when we're saying to Hillam as a community or as an individual in shul, at home, at an event, it all seems the same. It's all Hebrew words. Okay, we're saying this, Mizmor David, blah, 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 blah. Um, or this, Tehillim, blah, 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 blah. Um, but what the academics do is they say each one really is its own poetry. Each one has a unique voice and a unique goal of what they're trying to say. This person is complaining to God or this person is thanking God. So I wanted, so last week we did, um, uh, last week we did an individual lament um, and also a... I think it was, what was it? It was um, a petition to God. So this is a, the first one we're going to look at is Psalm 80 to Hill and uh, Pei, which is a communal lament. This is actually the smallest genre of the genres. Um, usually if someone's complaining or lamenting it from themselves, and this is saying, this is a, a group of people. And it starts off with the petition. So again, the, the first line is the Ketor, the, the introduction is Lamnatseach al Shoshanim Edut La Asaf Mizmor. For the leader on Shoshanim Edut, it's from the children of Asaf. So we'll do um, the, we'll go back and forth between a little bit of English and Hebrew, but we'll start with English, I guess. So give ear, O shepherd of Israel, who leads Joseph like a flock, appear because you are enthroned on the cherubim at the head of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Rouse your might and come to our help. Restore us, O God, and show us your favor that we may be delivered. So one thing I want to point out from the very beginning are the adjectives that they are and the verbs that they're using to describe God. They're saying, no heg kitzon, you're leading us like, um, like a shepherd leads his sheep. And you're sitting, you're enthroned on the, um, on the throne like the cherubim. And it turns again to um, God as saying that this is uh, your might when it says the Hebrew is techa, that your might. So it's clearly this um, almost praising of Hashem, it, all of these verbs about him being a leader, 
about him being enthroned and that he has a might and that Hashem is the savior. And it says, restore us, O God, show us your favor that we may be delivered. What is this relationship between the psalmist and God? It's a relationship that can be petitioned. Meaning if it was something that's distant, if it was something that this person did not feel like they can turn to God, then they wouldn't be able to say these things. Rouse your might, come to our help, restore us. So this is already a very intimate relationship between the poet and the and God. And it's someone who feels comfortable almost saying to God, you need to come help us. I we We think the salvation lies with you and you need to come help us now. It's a pretty positive in the beginning. Something clearly negative is happening here, but um, it's pretty positive. It's upward looking towards God. It's turning to him. But verse five is when it starts to turn to the complaint. Hashem Elohim Tzivakot, the God of the hosts, how long will you be wrathful towards the prayers of your people? That what is this saying? The problem of whatever's happening with the Jewish people is actually starting with God. God's the origin of the people because Hashem's the one. Hashem's angry with the Jewish people. And that's why whatever is happening for the poet is happening. Verse six, you have fed them tears as their daily bread, made them drink great measures of tears. Everyone's crying because God, you let this happen. Verse seven, you set us at strife with our neighbors. Our enemies mock us at will. So it's taking the blame slightly away from the enemies and saying, God, you're the one that's letting this happen. Which, and what now is reading through this, obviously in the last seven weeks, it's something that I have heard from people of saying like, how could God let this happen, right? I think we all feel anger and and, and dismay and animosity towards Hamas. But like, th but there's also for some people, they do feel like, how is God letting this happen? And here we have Tehillim validating and supporting those feelings and thoughts. Hashem is crying in the heavens with us, but it is at least validating that sentiment, I think. Oh, the verse eight, oh God of hosts, restore us, show us your favor that we may be delivered. So it says, even though this person is turning to God, they're clearly angry with God and they're saying God's the source of what's happening and then allowing the suffering. It's also saying, but Hashem, you're the one that can save us. You, you can restore us. Verse uh, nine, the next paragraph, verse nine through 12, the psalmist starts turning to history and saying, look what you've done throughout history. You plucked up a vine from Egypt. So now he's going back to Mitzrayim. We were stuck in Mitzrayim and now you're taking, you took us out. You expelled nations and planted it. You cleared a place for it and it took deep root and filled the land. You cleared B'nai Yisrael for us, uh, Eretz Yisrael for us. We, you took us out of Egypt. You brought us in. We had to wage wars, and you were able to clear the land for us. Look at all the look at all the times that you came to to save us. Source eleven, uh, verse eleven. The mountain was covered by its shade, mighty cedars by its boughs. So this could be alluding to either um, the midrash of Har Sinai that the Mount Sinai was turned over on its head over the Jewish people, like a chuppah that Hashem was giving them the Torah. But it could also be talking about when the the, the cedar wood that's created in the Beit that was built using for the Beit HaMikdash, that Hashem was creating this space where the Jewish people could have that intimate relationship with God. Its branches reach the sea, it shoots out of the rivers. So it's saying, the Psalmist is saying, look, God, you showed up for us all of these times of history, and we need you to show up now. So that's why in verse 13 and 14, he turned, the, the Psalmist is turning to God and saying, so where are you? Why did you breach its wall so that every passerby plucks its fruit? This is a very bald accusation of God. It's saying you let someone breach us, the Jewish people, and they were just plucking, they're plucking us off the trees like fruit. Wild boars gnaw at it and creatures on the field feed on it. Why did you let this happen, God? So therefore, it's verse 15 and 16. It's, oh, God of hosts, turn again. So it's not saying just save us, but again, Hashem, you saved us before. You've done this before. So it's both an accusation and also an acknowledgement. There's something positive here. Look down from the heavens and see and take note of that vine. 
the stock planted by your right hand, the stem you have taken as your own. And this is actually very sim similar imagery. Um, again, last week we talked about this too. There was similar imagery to Shir Hashirim of what it means to be embraced by God. Like with one hand, you held my head and the other one, you embraced me. So it's a saying the same thing here from the Song of Songs that Hashem, we need that loving embrace again of those two hands cocooning us and holding us in your arms. Um, we get a little bit trying to make the point again with the verse 17 and 18 for it is burned by fire and cut down perishing before your angry blast it's such strong language if you look at the hebrew it's just even like hearing it if, if someone didn't understand hebrew it sounds harsh it's just like a very harsh language of burning and fire and hashem's cutting down this angry blast Verse 18, grant your help to the man at your right hand, the one you have taken as your own. God, you've embraced us before. So do it again now. Take your right hand and pull us back in. And then the last two lines is the vow. The psalmist has complained. The psalmist has beaten his, his, his or her arms against the door, really angry at God. And they kind of got all their anger out. And now they say, verse nine, velo nasug mimecha. We're not going to turn away from you. Preserve our life that we may invoke your name. Hashem, we, we're here. We're not going to turn away. If you save us and when you save us, we're going to praise you. We're going to try to get your message out there and do tikkun olam and be there as, the, as, as our mission is supposed to be. Hashem Elohim Sivakot, which is, um, the way that he started the complaint, he's again now starting the vow at the end. Hashivenu, return us. Ha'er panecha v'nevasha'a. Um, restore us, show us favor so that we may be delivered. This conclusion, this vow is to remain faithful to Hashem. So we have this communal lament of this horrible thing that's been happening. But again, we went on this journey of expressing anger fully at God and it but it ends off with and Hashem when you show up for us we'll show up for you we want to be there we want to um support you your your message and your name as much as uh as you will to us and it kind of goes through this very emotional journey um of the psalmist I also just found it very I found it very relevant I found it very relevant from all the conversations I've been having of having this communal complaint of like just being a part of a group of people who are feeling something so strong um, and seeing and seeing the anger, the turning to God, the faith in God as well, I find really beautiful um, with with this psalm. That is, that's why we can, we can move that. That's Psalm 80. <laughs> um, I'm going to scroll up. Any Any thoughts or questions before we move on to another one? Welcome to hear any ideas. I, I, I have something to say. Yeah. The thought of being angry at Hashem is I, I just think I just I just don't think I could bring myself to really being angry at Hashem. I don't, okay. Well, first of all, I think that's amazing. <laughs> um, I mean, I just think that's a beautiful thing that that's not a natural thing for you to feel. Um, and I think that that's that's perfect example that Tehillim has something for everyone. Meaning the, the for me, the purpose of Psalm 80 is that for people who do feel anger, it's validating the anger. And it's also saying, but also go on the journey to work through the anger because Hashem is the one who's the source of good. He is the source that we're supposed to turn to. Um, but it's definitely not saying you have to feel the anger. I think it's really just validating those who do feel anger. Um, mm -hmm. But I also, it's all, which is also just an interesting point of that um, anger also, or any kind of negative sentiment means that there's a relationship there. Because if there wasn't, then it would be apathy. And it'll be like, okay, well, I'm just going to walk away. I'm not going to have this conversation. I don't care. If someone's angry, if someone's really sad, if someone wants to complain, it means because they care about the existing relationship and that the existing relationship is something's wrong that they want to repair. Yeah, but that's with the human. <laughs> that so that, but so so i think this is saying you can feel it towards god as well it's not a it's not a conversational relationship in the classic sense um 
but Hashem speaks to us in different ways, which can be frustrating <laughs> for people. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think I think your point is exactly right. There's there's to him that you that one person might relate to more than what other people might relate to. Yeah, you know, my question is why are you doing this to us rather than I'm angry at you? It's like, why is this happening? Why right. Did this happen? But Lament. Anger. Forlorn. How could you do this to us? Right. Um, was that the one one of the ones? Um okay, so so last, so that's where I found last week we did Psalm 13, mm-hmm. with Gimel which mm-hmm. is, it's only six psukim long, but it's exactly those questions, but there's a lot less anger. It's how long, Hashem, will you ignore me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I have cares on my mind and grief in my heart all day long? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Right. And then the second part is just, Hashem, look at me. Hashem, I trust in your faithfulness and my heart will exult in your deliverance. So it's interesting. It's exactly your point that Psalm 13 while it's also questioning God and it's also engaging God in kind of a surprising way, given that this is a, a piece of literature from the Tanakh, from the Bible, um, there's a lot less anger in Yud Gimel than here. And in and in and in and in 80 in Pei, it's much more blaming God. Whereas in Yud Gimel, it's just this like cry. Um, that's a beautiful point. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. So I was able to really see that because I didn't even like notice that as much. Um, I'm going to turn to Tehillim Kuf Chaf Vav, which is the top of the page of the link. I'll send it again, just in case there's someone here who's popped on later. Um, but I'm also sharing screen. Um, so this is a little bit more well-known and it's a little bit more, um, positive. This is Shir Hamalo that we say before benching. Um, so we can even sing it if we want, but, um, I, first of all, I just thought it'd be fun to do, um, a Tehillim that we know pretty well because it's, we say it with the, we say it for the, um, grace after meals, but I also found it really beautiful and relevant for today as well. I don't know. Maybe I I probably could connect any Tehillim to what's going on today. Um, so, uh, it's pretty short too. And it's got a lot of ver- um, verses and phrases that are just so familiar, even beyond the fact that we might say it in benching. So Shir Hamalot, Song of Ascents. Um, B'shuv Hashem et shivatzion hayinu kachomim. When Hashem restores the fortune of Zion, we were like dreamers. Az yamale skok pinu ulshonenu rina. Our mouths are filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. As Yomu Bargoyim, then the rest of the nations are going to say, Higdil Hashem la'asot im ele. The Hashem has done great things for the Jewish people. So it's this return to Zion. It's this joyous, happy uh, retelling of what it means to return to Yerushalayim, to Eretz Yisrael. Higdil Hashem la'asot imanu hayinu simechim. Then it's turning to Hashem. Restore. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed a pasuk. The Lord will do great things for us, and we shall rejoice. Pasuk Dalid. Shuva Hashem et shivatenu ka'afikim banegev. Restore our fortunes, Hashem, like water courses in the Negev. Hazorim bedima berina iksovru. They who sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. So the people who are crying, they're going to be happy. They're going to have tears of joy. Haloch yelech uvacho. And those who goes along with reaping, mesha chazara bayavo berina nose alu motav, carrying the sea bad, but I'll come back with songs of joy, carrying his sheep. So not only are they going to be joyous and happy, they're going to be plentiful. They're going to be successful. All of these um all of these beautiful ideas and sentiments. Uh, there's an interesting point to make here that the tenses are all over the place. <laughs> so if you look at, um, oh, here we go. I was like trying to find my notes. The verb tenses really don't really make sense. So it says, when Hashem restores the fortunes of Zion, we were like dreamers. So we've got, 
the future, Hashem's going to restore the fortunes of Zion, and we were like dreamers. Our mouth shall be filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Again, it's all of that future tense of like, these things are going to happen. Um, and then the nations, they'll say, Hashem's done great things for them. Um, and then the rest of it is, we're going to rejoice we're going to do all these things. And there's the petition of restore our fortunes, Hashem, and that all of these things are going to happen. So there's a, the commentaries are really like, where, when is this happening? Is this, what, why is the, why is the tense confusing? Because the classic sense is this is Shabbat Zion. It's when the Jewish people were coming back from the return of Bavel and we, they were rejoicing upon their, upon their return. This is actually, um, compared to, and this is why we're able to hit so many Tehillim today, um, Psalm 126 is often compared to Psalm 137 at the at the bottom of page one, which is Al Naharot Bavel. So we'll pause for a second just to go to 137. Um, Psalm 137, Al Naharot Bavel is the most descriptive Tehillim we had. Last week we had pointed out that most of the Tehillim, the time period is vague, the events around what what inspired the poet to say those things are vague because it's we can relate to it at any point. This one, Psalm 137, is the most descriptive and the most distinct of, oh, it's specifically about when we were exiled in Babylon. By the, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. We uh, That's verse one. We also wept when we remembered Zion. Like it's clearly the Jewish people leaving Zion and they're sitting in Babylon. On willows in its mist, we hung our harps. We used to be joyous and we used to sing and do music and we we hung up our instruments. Verse three, for there our captors asked us words of song and our tormentors asked us mirth, sing for us the song of Zion. So they were chiding them. They were saying, hey, why don't you sing about Zion? Sing about Yerushalayim because look what you are. You were exiled. You're now here in Babylon with us. How shall we sing the song of the Lord on foreign soil? And this is, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, im eshkachich, Yerushalayim, may my right hand forget its skill, yitishkach yemini. May my tongue clip to my palate, tidbak l'shoni l'chiki, if I do not remember you, Yerushalayim, tishkach yemini, tidbak l'shoni l'chiki, im lo eskerai, im lo a'ala at Yerushalayim al rosh, Simchati, if I do not bring up Yerushalayim at the beginning of my joy. So they're sitting in Babylon, they're exiled, they're being mocked, and they're singing this new song of, I have, if I forget you, O Yerushalayim, which is obviously a very famous song. Remember, O Lord, the sons of Edom, the day of Yerushalayim, those who say, raise it, raise it down to us to its foundation. Um, the last line is also very um, poetic. The last two lines. When it says, the daughter of Babylon, who is destined to be plundered, praiseworthy is he who repays you, your recompense that you have done to us. The Bat Bavel. So just the illusion that there's a daughter of Babylon, the uh, fr common phrase in Echa, and also actually in Sher Shirim, is the Benot Yerushalayim, being a daughter of Jerusalem, the women of Jerusalem. So here it's saying, we're not even the women of Jerusalem anymore. We're gone. We're in exile. We're not here. Um, so... Psalm 137, which is a very clear psalm about being taken out of Yerushalayim and exiled into Babylon, is in contrast to Psalm 126, which is all about Shivat Zion and the return to exiles. Um, the um, one question I'll pose, and I'll, I'll pause for a second, is do you think when we're looking at Psalm 126, is it an event that has already taken place and it's kind of recalling what we were hoping would happen? Meaning the people have already returned to Yerushalayim and these are the words that we had said of Hashem, when we were in Belval, this is what we felt and we wanted to return and we asked for you to restore us. Or um, is it a dream? Is it something that they're saying, you know, they're vividly imagining Hashem redeeming them in the future. So I'll pause for a second. Look at the words here um, of Psalm 126. Do you think this is 
a retelling of the story or a hope and a dream of the story? Yeah, uh, go ahead, unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. I definitely think it was when they were returning because it says, Bishuv Hashem at Shiva Tzion. At the time he was returning the exiles. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and it's so wonderful to know, this psalm was in contention with Hatikva, mm. the national anthem of the new Jewish state. Oh, that's beautiful. You know that, and when you when you look at it, it's so obvious. It looks like it was written for the occasion. You know, so isn't that incredible? That, yeah. Um, the wow. other thing, uh, another thing that's worth noting. Two things I want to say. One is um, the Afikim ba Negev. Mm -hmm. um, the Afikim ba in the Negev are very strong. And very quick, you could be looking at a riverbed that's absolutely dry. Mm. And then a moment later, you're washed away because the water wow. just, because the, the ground is so hard from the sun, it can't absorb. So when rainwater falling on the mountains finally gets to a given place in the Negev, it, it just rolls through like a, like a barrel rolling over the ground. And it can be very dangerous. But the point that the uh, author, the poet's making here is that this is something that it, it, was, it was a strong event that had such power, just like the power of the Afikim. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say that I find disturbing is the mm. Hazorim Bedima Barina Yiksoru is it's aspirational. You know, when I look at the um, videos that we're seeing now every day of the uh, hostages returning. And, um, <clears throat> you know, some of them will learn that, uh, you know, their parents were killed. Yeah. So whether it be children learning that or, or older people learning, in any case, they're coming back and all of a sudden the whole family that they loved is wiped out. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're crying now, but I can't imagine that they're going to be laughing ever. Yeah, it yeah. is. But, so, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll comment on the, the second point first. Um, I've been I've I actually had to I deleted Facebook and social media off my phone today because I was reading different reports of what the hostages went through um, at, when they were in captivity and then also what they're learning when they come home. And it is such a, such a bittersweet return. Um, exactly for what you're saying. Like it is so, it's so many of the people had no idea what was happening on the outside to their families. And now they're learning. Um, so I actually was like, I just, I, I can't, I couldn't handle it anymore. Oh, yeah, just also some of the children yeah. we're exposed to is just horrible. So it, it is like I was thinking of like, we're all so happy they're being returned every day, but it is so bittersweet. Yeah. Um, that line reminds me of the line in um, uh, Tehillim Lamed, Be'erev Yalin Bechi Ulevok at night, um, there may be tears, but joy will come in the morning, and um, that's that's a prayer. You hope yeah. that's going to be the case, but so, you have this terrible feeling. We're going to do thirty next. It Perfect. Won't. It's right here. Pasuk, um, pasuk six of verse thirty, yeah. right here. The Arab yelling bechi ulabokerina. That's perfect that you're connecting them. Also in that same uh, tehillim there with the um where where did six go there? Oh sorry, I can scroll down. Uh here we go. Yeah, Psalm uh, 30. Uh Kirega Biapo Chaim Birtso no. Uh when terrible things are happening, and we say that's 
Hashem's okay. anger. Uh, it, it's also, but we also know that life, his desire is for life. And we have that same kind of thought in the uh, other psalm that we right. Sort of think. Yeah. As much as we can blame Hashem and be angry, it also means he's the one who's giving us life and giving us yeah. goodness and joy. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, though, which really struck me was when you talked about uh, the 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 uh, Afikim ba Negev, they translated to the water courses in the Negev. Um, when you said like it could just be you could have a dry bed and then there could just be a rush of water. So I also do feel a little bit like that with Jewish history, that mm -hmm. it for good and for bad um, of just sometimes like there will just be a swift salvation of just like, wow, this is like 1967 was this incredible yeah. um, turnaround of fortune. Um, but also, you know, on October 7th, our world changed and turned upside down. So it's, it's, it also has yeah. that to me was, um, that's very powerful. Um, I, but also, I love that point and it reminded me, I totally forgot that this was one of the contenders for the national anthem. Yeah. And it was controversial. They went with Hatikva, which did not have Hashem's name and is not from the Torah. Right. Um, but um, yeah, that's, it's, that's, that's incredible um yeah go, going back yeah. to, to 137 you omitted the last line which is so disturbing to me I scroll down uh, 137 what what is that exactly saying oh oh i didn't even do that um praise praiseworthy is he who will take and dash your infants against the rock yeah <laughs> Oh, yeah. What, um, is, what is that saying at the end of this sum? I mean, it does, there's nothing after it. And and what comes before it, it seems very totally out of context with everything else that's that's in there. Yeah, um, I know you can't see me because I can't figure out this other co this computer, but I'm Evelyn, Evelyn Rexy, not Stan. You know, it says, Stan. no worries. I was just actually reading that. That's the weekday. Um, so share Malo say that on during the week. Al Hanaros Bovel, that was the exact line that I had a problem with. And we had company, and I'm going, Can you guys come in here? Are you going to see this? Yeah, so seriously, it wow, well, yeah, what, is it, what does it mean? Um, well, I mean, do you want to do, do you do you have any thoughts on what it means? No, it? It, no, it just it like I said, it's to me, it seems very disjointed from the rest of it. It just sort of comes out of nowhere to me. What's it talking about? And why is that fortunate? If you want to feel a little better about the fact that you can't understand it, it's good to know that Robert Alter mm. is probably the greatest of some translators on his on this verse writes, no moral justification can be offered for this notorious concluding line. I was trying, I, I think I left it downstairs, but I have the Robert Alter book. I was I meant to mention that. Thank you for mentioning. Unbelievable commentary on Tehillim. Um, it's the first one I go to. Oh, really really and i think I, I used some of him last week and I, I i had the thought of like i should have had, i meant to mention this um but this, um, this line makes us think about sadly about today yeah you know when we hear about the horrible atrocities the barbarism um so that's that's actually that's exactly you know I it's it, it, yeah. if, if we're going to date this it's probably 2,500 years old. And we know that the enemy that we're facing today acts like people might have acted at their worst 2,500 years ago. It was also in the Holocaust, what was done to infants. Yeah. So it, it's a very upsetting line. Right. It, 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 re, it reminds you of persecution that we have been a part of for generate for years, for, yeah. for, for, 
more than generations for our well, existence. Right. When they say never again is now, so that's yeah. the same depravity that happened in the Holocaust. Yeah. Yes. And g- going back to 126, that uh, yeah. the line, and we will have been like dreamers. So when you read that, the the book about yeah. the reunification yeah. of Jerusalem is called Like Dreamers. Exactly. It's, Here we are again. I think and, I have uh, um, yeah, right behind me. Yes. So uh, it's just it's it just struck me because that I assume that's where they took. Yes, I don't know. Sure. Klein Halevi didn't make up the phrase. <laughs> no, no, clearly not. Um, but, uh, um, yep. Would you be- know, right now I've been taking a lot of solace <laughs> in 126. And I think it's because I didn't read into it as deeply as we're talking about it right now. <laughs> because if you read it quickly no, and for face value, solace. it's like so beautiful. And hopefully this is how we will be restored. Yeah. Amen. 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 So, yeah. well, I, I mean, I hope you still do take solace in it <laughs> um, to go through some of the commentaries on it. So the, um, the, the Aramaic Targum translates Hayinu Kecholmim, that the, the, we were like dreamers, actually as um, associating it with the Hebrew term for illness of hachlama, because um, in modern Hebrew, when you want to say get well soon, they say hachlama mehira. You should have a quick recovery, not just a refuah shlema. Um, so it's so it's almost like saying at this momentous occasion in Jewish history, we feel like we have recovered from a long and painful and seemingly terminal illness and the illness of exile, and yet. Uh, that we're, we're returning and not like dreamers but it's like we were sick it's like we were termini- terminally ill but Hashem turned our fate around and we were able to return and Hashem's going to restore us um, a- another beautiful idea I saw from, from Rabbi Sachs which I do try not to quote him because I feel like he's a go-to for everyone so I always try to be different but <laughs> He sometimes has just beautiful things to say. So I want to share it. Um, so Rabbi Sachs points out that Sion is not just the name for Yerushalayim, but Sion is the name for um, the land of Israel in general. And it's specifically linked to the word Mitsuyan, um, which means special and distinctive. And his point is that Sion is not just a place, but a way of life. And that Jews are called to moral excellence. And so Hashem not only created a special place on earth, but a place on earth, but also the ideal place for spiritual growth, to be an incubator for for moral clarity and for moral direction, which I also find very meaningful now, given the lack of morals from Hamas towards our people and that we're, we're trying to be as moral and as upright as possible, even through this atrocity. And that Psalm 126 for Rabbi Sachs is saying, this is also about how we should live. And that when Hashem returns, returns the Jewish people, um, it will be with a heightened spirituality um, and heightened moral clarity than before. Um. Radak thinks that this whole Tehillim is recounting the feelings of longing we felt before the return. So it's, they are returned. This is after the exile. And they're going back to saying, this is what we were feeling. This is, this is what we felt. And we were Hayinu Kahoman, just like dreamers. And the dream came true. Hashem returned us. A more modern take on this. Um, actually, before I get to the modern take, because it's I, I, I do think it's very powerful, um, I just want to point out, so I have here Psalm 126 and Psalm 126 restructured. So there is um, there was one interpretation in the Dat Mikra that the because the language doesn't always work out and the tense is kind of back and forth, that um, Shir Hama, that, that this psalm was actually intended to be sung in antiphony. And Tiffany is when it's a call and response singing. Um, so I heard someone give it a great example of, it's kind of like in Les Mis, 
when you have different groups of people singing about the French Revolution. So someone singing about the French Revolution and someone singing about not dying, dying from cholera. And then you have the another group in the back and they're all singing their different parts so that this psalm can actually be split up into what each party is singing back and forth to each other. And it gets restructured that way. So if you look, Psalm 126 on top is um, as it's written in the Tanakh. Psalm 126 restructured is the antiphony of this group is saying, Beshuv Hashem et Shivatzion, when the Lord restores the fortune of Zion. And then the other group answers, Shuva Hashem et Shivatenu, restore our fortunes, O Lord. So that's Pasuk Aleph and Pasuk Dalit. And it's the call and response. The, the next line is, we were like dreamers. And the second one is, ka'afikim ba'negev, like the water courses in the Negev that we had. We were just like dreamers with this rush of water. Verse two, as yamale spoke pinu, our mouths shall be filled with laughter. And the other group responds, hazorim bidima, they who sow in tears, o shonenu rina, our, to our, our tongues with songs of joy, birina iksoru, shall reap with songs of joy. So it, it puts those two psukim together. So I, I don't, because of the timing, I just want to kind of move ahead a little bit, but I just love that idea of, it's not just someone sitting there saying they're on Tehillim, but you have these two groups going back and forth, singing this song, and it might not go in the order that it was said because they're having this beautiful antiphony of this call and response. Um, I'll finish this Tehillim with Amos Chacham. So Amos Chacham um, wrote the commentary of Tehillim on Dat Mikra. And he offers an interpretation that um, is very specifically a post-1948 Jewish state interpretation, interpretation. And he says, even after our return to Eretz Yisrael and Yushalayim, there still remains much to pray for, as we are fully experiencing right now. And that we can understand the final verses of this psalm as referring not to necessarily the tearful seeds sown in exile, but the blood and tears and sweat that's shed over the course of Shivat Zion. Post-1948, we are back. We have an IDF. We have all these incredible things. But there's still what to daven for, and there's still what to pray for. So the end, when it says, though he goes along weeping and carrying the sea bag, he shall come back with songs of joy carrying his sheep. That that's actually referring to, we do have Shivat Zion, and we're still working through the tears and the weeping, but it will hopefully end in triumph with songs of joy, and we're going to be successful carrying carrying the sheep. Um, so hopefully... It's a real Tehillim, a real psalm, but hopefully still does give solace. Um, if I, it's nine o'clock, so anyone wants to sign off, I completely understand. Um, I'm just going to go to Psalm 30 to finish off, which is Mizmor Shir Chanukat Habayit David, given that Chanukah's next week. But um, I, there's something really special about this psalm that I'll, I'll get to. I can give it away now, actually, just because I find it so beautiful. Um, this is the very psalm that Natan Sharansky decided that he was going to say upon the upon his release, and he did say when he was released from captivity. So I thought I I kind of just got chills when I was doing the research of this psalm, given that I wanted to do it because Hanukkah was next week, and it turns out this is what Natan Sharansky said, um, in, and he talks about it in his book *Fear No Evil*, which is one of my favorite books. Um, and he said, cause he felt like this was appropriate upon the release of his captivity. And I thought that was, um, eerily relevant for today. So the, um, Joe, yeah. I uh, uh, I, I, when you're done, I just wanted yeah. to go back to one of the, um, the Sukkim. but when you're done with what sure. you were saying. Okay. You got it. And if I don't, please just speak up again. <laughs> but I will try to remember. Um, um, so this, so this is, um, it's an interesting song because the dedication of it is Chanukat Habayit David. It's a dedication to the house of David, which is why we say it 
in davening all the time and it's connected to Hanukkah, but the actual, if you, the actual text of the rest of it is more of an individual praise and thanksgiving. It doesn't seemingly have anything to do with the Beit HaMikdash. So if you just look at a couple of the lines, verse two, I will exalt you, O Lord, you have raised me up. You have not allowed my enemies to rejoice, to rejoice over me. Hashem, um, I have cried out to you and you have healed me. Hashem, you have brought my soul from the grave. You have revived me from the descent into the pit. Sing to the Lord, his pious ones, and give thanks to his holy name for his wrath lasts but a moment. Life results from his favor, which is, I mean, this is the exact point that we were making earlier about, about the fact that Hashem is the source of bad, but, but they're saying, but this is, that's fleeting. Hashem's also the source of good. And I, it's verse seven. And I said in my tranquility, I will never falter. Also, as I read this, if you think about Natan Sharansky sitting, sitting in a KGB prison, these are the words that he's saying, like, I'm not faltering. Hashem, I'm singing to you. Hashem, I'm going to be there for you. O oh, Lord, with your will, uh, verse eight, you set up my mountain to be might and you hid your countenance. And I became fright I became frightened. But to you, O oh Lord, I would call and to the Lord, I would supplicate. I turned to you, Hashem, when I was scared and when I needed you. Verse 10, what gain is there in my blood and my descent to the grave? Will dust thank you? Will receive your truth? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. Shema Hashem, v'chaneni Hashem, haya ozerli. You have turned my lament into dancing. You loosened my sackcloth and girded me with joy. I was in this really bad place, and Hashem, you turned it around for me. Lama'an yizamercha kavod v'lo yidom Hashem alokai le'olam odeka, so that my soul will sing praises to you and not be silent. Not only am I thankful to you, but I'm going to sing about this and it's going to be out there. Oh Lord, my Hashem, I will thank you forever. So we can clearly see where I think it talks just about, for someone who is in captivity or in a very negative place that they, they're turning to Hashem when they're alone and in, the, in their depths and Hashem, Hashem answered. Um, you have kind of the retelling of the distress. You have calling out to Hashem for salvation and it ends off with that thanksgiving. Some of the interpretations around it. So Rashi says, David wrote it for Shlomo HaMelech when the base HaMikdash was to be built, which would explain why it's from an individual. Because Shlomo HaMelech, having built the Beit HaMikdash, this is his personal prayer, um, which is just a beautiful idea of David saying, like, I'm not going to be around for the Beit HaMikdash, but I want to be a little bit a part of it. So I'll write the tefillah for Shlomo. Um, the Ibn Ezra thinks that David wrote it for the dedication of the second and third, meaning yet to be built Beit HaMikdash temples. Um, and the troubles allude to the different periods of exile. So this is referring to our history. This is referring to our depths, but that we will be strong and Hashem will help us be strong in our faith towards him. Um, interestingly, the Ben Ishchai thinks this is specifically referring to David foreseeing Antiochus coming and that this was a song that was, was to be sung by the Maccabean, specifically around Hanukkah, that they were saying like, we're gonna fight this and we're gonna, we're gonna get through, um, we're gonna get through the Greeks coming. Um, and the most, the most creative response to how it is the dedication of the house of David, but the rest of it doesn't really sound like a Beit HaMikdash, it's actually from the Malbim, that when it says the Bayit le David, the Bayit, the house, it actually means David's soul. And the song is about David HaMelech's recovery from spiritual illness, that he was kind of at his worst and committing the worst of acts. And it has nothing to do with the Beit HaMikdash, but more about him, Hashem, about David HaMelech stepping out of his own um, negative place. Um, I'll end with Rav Hirsch, which I thought was beautiful, which is that the point of the Beit HaMikdash is to bring an intimate relationship between God and man. And that it's still appropriate. We have this very personal, intimate, and singular voice thanking Hashem, because that's the point of the Beit HaMikdash. That's the point of prayer. It's connecting one-on-one -on -one to God and feeling that one-on-one -on -one connection. So it makes sense, even within the context of dedicating a whole psalm for the Beit HaMikdash, that it's saying, Hashem, and I have this place to connect with you, and I'm going to turn to you for this Thanksgiving. Um, it's this it's a it's a vigorous psalm of thanksgiving. It expresses hoda to Hashem for having saved 
someone from death. And it's a, as Natan Sharansky notes, it's, it's about a deliverance that involved a speedy and radical turn of events that I think is something we are all davening for. As the, as the number goes down in captives, um, but also kind of just going forward with, you know, Shivat Zion of Yerushalayim and Israel. And I think the landscape of Israel and the landscape of the Jewish people is probably forever changed now, but hopefully, um, hopefully with uh, some of these words of Tehillim that we've seen, we have faith and hopefully have faith that uh, we will come out stronger and we will come out restored and singing Hashem's Hashem praises. I also meant to mention in the beginning that like all of this learning should be the continued return of the hostages, which is exciting given that last week we said that they none of them were had been returned yet. Um, so it is in the schud of the continued return and also the continued success of and protection of the IDF. Um, Evelyn, you wanted to say something about, and anyone's yeah. welcome to uh, we're we're sign off. Um, yeah, 126. Yeah. And 126. Rolling up. Yes. Okay. Um, so I just, uh, I'm not confused, but I just noticed something. We're like dreamers. Um, Peshuva, Dosham, Eshiva, Sion, Hayinu, Kachomi. And it's very interesting because I thought that you're know, like, they're like dreamers. I'm dreaming that someday everything will be good. But I was just reading the Rashi explanation in the Tehillim, and it's very interesting because what he says, and I want to make sure I quote it pro properly. Um, where does it go now? I know. Uh, I can just. Uh, we will be like dreamers when the long-awaited return to Zion finally comes to plan to pass. The recollection of the past expression of the exile will swiftly fade away and seem like a bad dream. Oh, and that's for Doc. So hmm. I just thought that was interesting. You know, I. I Huh. Unless we really study it and look at translations and different, you know, abortion, it could mean so many different things to so many different people. Which is poetry, right? right. I mean, like exactly. that's exactly, that's really interesting because it's then it, so it, Redak's almost saying we were like dreamers in the negative sense, that it was like a nightmare. Right. Um, wow, that's fascinating. I hadn't heard that one. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's exactly, I mean, it's poetry. That's, it's, it's, uh, biblical poetry, which is, which is open to interpretation, which I also had noted last week about the fact that it's in Ketuvim of the three sections of Tanakh, Torah, traditionally an Orthodox view is direct words that Hashem told Moshe to write down for us. Nevi'im are the recorded conversations of Hashem, but Ketuvim is inspired works. It's, it's, it's a little bit more at the whim of the person who wrote it, which means it's going to be very open to interpretation. Um, certainly an entire book of poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, if anyone hasn't read uh, Fear Fear No Evil by Natan Sharansky or just hasn't read it in a while, he really talked about Tehillim in such a beautiful way that I forgot until I was doing this research and wish I had brought it in more. Um, he had a book of Tehillim. It was like one of the one things that was confiscated from him. And he went on hunger strikes while he was in prison to have his Tehillim back. It was such a small, difficult copy to read that he, when he finally did get the Tehillim book, he spent time writing all 150 Psalms over again. Um, and he didn't have like a Jewish, it was his Jewish education at that point. Um, and he he talks about what Tehillim meant to him, which is really, really powerful and incredible. And um, I kind of wish I had started off the whole series with it. So I'm encouraging anyone to go back and, and read Natan Sharansky's Fear No Evil, specifically his. Um, and he talks about different Tehillim, too. He does his own his own drusha and commentary on it. So it's really incredible. Yeah, Evelyn. 
Okay, I just wanted to, because I I saw this before in chat in Psalm thirty. At the end, it says, um, "Shema Hashem." <laughs> read when you're moving it. Sorry. Shema Hashem v'sanayni Hashem haya ozeli v'fachta mispedi l'maholi pitachta zaki v'tazreni simcha. You have turned, hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me, O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my lament, lament into dancing for me. You loosened my sackcloth and girded me with joy, so that my soul will sing praises to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will thank you forever. And what this is saying is, is David Amelech is, you know, was yelling at a Kaddish <laughs> So much, and it's saying how much Hashem will forgive us. And I guess maybe we could learn from that that if Hashem can forgive us, you know, after we blasted him, and I, I I'm one of them, uh, then you know, families don't talk to each other. It's terrible. Hmm. My last thought. <laughs> yeah. It's well, nice to meet you, though, Ruthie. It's also <laughs> thank you for coming to the class and sharing. Um, uh, but I think you were you're saying also kind of reflects a little bit Kafikim um, Banegev, right? That that there could be a dry bed of water, and then there's going to be a rush of water. So you turn my lament into dancing. Yeah, you loosen my sackcloth and girded me with joy. It's that um, last week we talked about the the merism, the 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 contrast of the polarity of one thing to the other in poetry. That we see a lot in Tehillim, standing and sitting, standing and lying down, the night and the day. There's a lot of that in Tehillim, of showing the extremes and the breadth of whatever it is they're trying to express. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining, and I really appreciate um, so many people speaking up. I learn, I learn so much, and get, I get such a deeper understanding of Tehillim with your thoughts. So thank you. Is this um, and the- I will be coming this weekend to young Israel for Shabbat. So I hope to see many of you over the course of Shabbat. Oh, very nice. Hope to meet you. <laughs> I haven't I'll been a, at Joel a long time. So. so I'll give a little plug. I know it's late and it's dark, but um, the there we are. Um, the Pavas are hosting an Oneg for the community Friday night. We'll, get, we'll be sending out a flyer tomorrow and the rest of the week, but they're hosting an Oneg Friday night after dinner at their home. Um, and my husband and I will be leading a conversation about Hanukkah together with everyone. So if you um, have the strength or energy to come out at night, would love to see you there in addition to Shul. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for this class. It was lovely. Thank, thank you, you very much. Josh, it was very nice. It's I've, good to I have another question. Yeah. I was just going to thank you as well. I appreciate it. Thank you. thank you. Do you think you might be doing more classes on Tehillim? Because I would love that. I can. I mean, I if if that's an, if that's an interest, I um, I'm my good. appreciation of Tehillim has grown in preparation <laughs> for this whole course. Um, so it's it's somewhat selfish on my part that I get to learn the Torah. So um, yeah, if there's interest, I'm happy to do it. Um, yeah, it would be wonderful because there's so many interest. of us. Okay, yeah. there's a lot of interest. So many yeah. of us are saying, sitting, saying Tehillim day and night. It's we true. have a Tehillim group. I mean, we maybe do. you'd like I to speak learned. to us. <laughs> That's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll, nice. so we'll schedule something. Okay. Yes, speaker. Thank, Thank you so awesome. much. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good hey, night. Have a good Thank night, you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Good to see you all.